We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. They will run some half blood and half blood and give you half blood. Now I'll show you what it is. Now I'll show you what it is. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello, welcome to Varm Blog. And today we're going to talk about dreams, delusions, social media bubbles, and the the parts of our life that are obsession with the abstract theoretical apparatuses of Marxism our most political questions do not answer. There's a lot to this and there's a lot to think about. And I have a feeling the questions that I raise today and the answers that I give in hard numbers are going to make many people uncomfortable. But it's something we have to deal with if we are going to be meaningful in our understanding of what is going on. I talked about hillfooting in an earlier Farm Blog solo video from this week. And the lead up to fascism. I talked about the fact that we've had anti-fascist activism now for five or six years. And yet, as things seem to be more on the real horizon and the larger problems seem to accumulate, that people seem quieter than ever. Yes, there are individual leftist groups out in the streets. In fact, there are plenty every day. But where did their allies go? Where did their donations go? Why did the mutual aid group seem to run out of steam in most cities three years into COVID? Why is this too much to ask of people? Why is homelessness continuing to be a problem in America? What all is going on? There are some other comments I want to address in recent... Uh, video commentary. One, people said that I thought that the national question was a joke. I actually do not think the national question was a joke. My discussion about the national question has been that there is no good answer for it. There's no single way to divide up what peoples have legitimate claims to nationhood, why we should think nation states are a valid form of socialist government, since they are inherently linked to the Treaty of Westphalia and beginning of bourgeois republicanism. And that I think justice and any talk of justice is something that people use to vindicate their own moral predilections. That when most people talk about justice, they mean either revenge for the past, fairness, are some aesthetic criterion which you're often not bothering to define. A just world is a fairy tale for children. And unfortunately, you can't undo anthropic decay, violence, loss, tragedy. Time's arrow goes in one direction as far as we know, and nothing redeems that. What you can do, however, is create a more fair world in the sense that human uh, frailties, mistakes, injust <laughs> injustices, for lack of a better term, barbarism is probably the better way to think of it, can be ended for the future and people can have some autonomy over their lives 
And that does make the national question pertinent to people who have been subject to various major powers taking over and uh, taking over the communities and ripping out their autonomy. But the thing is, that is not a modern problem. That is not unique to capitalism. There is no country on earth that is formed from a people who did not engage in some form of settlerism that I know of. The scale changed with the Industrial Revolution and the end of the long 14th century, sure. But the world did not start then, nor does it end now. Our answers to the national question have to take this into consideration. I, for one, don't have an easy answer, and I won't pretend to offer you one. But I want to look at some things about our current questions of the world. Because what I've noticed and what I've been criticized for, and this, this show goes out to my longtime frenemy, Keith S. Uh, more friend than enemy, actually. But someone who's been a gobfly in my ear for a long time. And he asked me some legitimate questions about the kinds of answers I get on my show. What are these obsessions with marginal political figures, even if these political figures might have major backers? Why don't we ever talk about the sensuous life people live in? Not just about the PMC question or the working class, but about poverty, about the kinds of poverty, about the way different poverty looks and feels. Why do we leave this up to liberal sociologists and don't talk about it ourselves? And why don't we talk about the rich? Not this, the bourgeois rich, but the professional rich. And the differences between levels of professionals and how we can tell their difference, how they even act, speak, have different assumptions about the world that we can sociologically fairly generalize correctly. And the same is true of many of the other classes. Marxist analysis doesn't deal with this because it doesn't deal with habitats the world in which we are formed, and it doesn't deal with income and other sectional differences. Although Marx does admit they exist, he started working out theories around them, social categories to make them make sense. But he defined class totally in terms of production and ownership of production in his theoretical work. In his polemical work, class is more vague and is adjusted to his audience considering who is talked to, who is talking to at the time. Is there a strong division between the polemical, the analytic, and the journalistic work of Marx? No, they all inform each other. But they do have different levels of strictness in how they're using terms. So let's talk about the poor. Let's talk about the government. Let's talk about the military. Let's talk about who benefits and who doesn't, and why sectional solidarity seems so hard for the working class. It's not about nonsense like barista gate. Or even who is productive or non-productive to capital. These are analytics used to confuse people and to keep them involved in a culture war. And the culture war removes you from the valid politics of your life. But it's the result of real failures. The reason why we always talk about fascism as a result of the crisis of liberalism is because fascist ideology and the general Bonapartism that enabled it and the New Deal and even the Bonapartist parts of the socialist experiments and why they seem necessary, results of failures, regressions, and the inability of bourgeois classes to cohere and rule. While it is true that there is more solidarity amongst the rich than the poor, that solidarity is not total, or there would not be political divides. We might talk about republicrats, our bourgeois allegiance on some issues, and it'd be very clearly true, but on others versus productive versus rentier economy are on kinds of development or on who gets taxed and where and how much tax should even 
non-capitalist pay. This divides capitalist policymakers and professionals and managers who work underneath them. And where has the capitalist go? Gone. Individual capitalists must still exist, but the structural nature of capital that has literally been divided and dispersed amongst legal concepts, corporations, stocks, bonds, joint ownerships, diffusion, makes it harder to know who you're talking about. And yet we do know that 10% of the population in the U.S. controlled 70% of the wealth. By the way, when you get statistics about race on this that are reduced to flat categories, you have to ask yourself, well, if, are, is white people only 10% of the population and not, say, 60-something? Are there no black people in that 10% or Asians or whoever? And you will see that that 10% is diversifying, but that the old wealth has accumulated for centuries. And yes, those people are wasps, not even just white people for the most part, although increasingly white wasps was expanded to white, is expanded, and then it's expanded again. It is a very effective bourgeois control me mechanism to keep us focused on small ethnic differences or even biological ones that tie ethnic and population drift to some abstract like race. And when critics of capital get too close, what happens? Well, they aren't killed anymore. They're made into consultants and become book publishers and become wealthy. There's almost nothing that capital can't recuperate because there's almost nothing that can't be turned into either commodities or rents. And yet overall, it does seem like profitability is harder to maintain. Look at the stock market and physical commodities. Look at the rates of return. Look at the percentages. Look at the GDP percentages. Yes, it is an imperfect ra ratio, ratio, but it's declining everywhere in the world. Except for the poorest countries where you see the fastest gains the quickest. And that is not statistically surprising. But they usually get caught in the, quote, middle income trap, unquote. They get stuck to use world systems language in the semi-periphery. But often, the average person and their purchasing power in the middle class is often not that different. We have to admit, for example, that almost all governments get their legitimacy, not just from their elites, but from a middle class underneath them that, some, that makes, depending on the country, between 40 and 20% of the middle and high income worlds. That is where the political divides and debates come from, not just the capitalists themselves. Marxists often call this whole spectrum bourgeois, but that is technically speaking incorrect. But let us ask, how does this feel? I had Dr. Clyde Burr on a few months ago, and we talked about the lumpenization of a lot of the working class. What we now call the precariat, make up whatever new word for it you wish. I am nominal about the names of concepts. But let's talk about that. I'm going to share some stats with you. And I will put these links in the show notes.
you will notice here, I want you to look at life expectancy continued to fall in 2021. There's been a drop in life expectancy in America that had gone on and off since the middle of the Obama administration. In fact, as soon as Stephen Picker, Pinker wrote his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, to say that everything was getting better and, and using global statistics to justify this, he was ignoring that in the developed world, this is stalling out. Life expectancy in the U.S. has been falling for a while. Life expectancy decreased from 78 years in 2019 to 76 years in 2020 and 76.6 years in 2021. The reason why people seem freaked out is in ways that they might not even realize their world is getting worse and it is literally a matter of life or death and not just on racial terms as it is often presented. In fact, decreases in the gap between races have often been um, quite different. Now, for you to think that it was just COVID, I want you to look at this. While other high-income countries, even during COVID years, saw a life expectancy increase in 2021, recovering about half of their losses from 2020, U.S. life expectancy continues to fall. This speaks volumes about the consequence of how the U.S. handled the pandemic. But we must also admit that it is not just the pandemic. U.S. life expectancy started to shorten before the pandemic, or at least stall out. Sure, you can say there's no easy gain. Sure, we can talk about obesity. We can talk about other diseases. But the major cause of it is mostly alcoholism and drug overdose. Which brings me to a question. Why aren't leftists talking more about fentanyl and the opioid epidemic? Do we want to be seen as unfun? There's nothing fun about opioid addiction, trust me. There's nothing fun about me having to answer the phone to, to people that I used to know in my hometown who are struggling with recovery and failing. I know them. I'm from that world. I got out. Many of the people that I love did not. Do you think I'm okay with that? And no, they're not all white. My anecdotal observations are not data, but the data also backs this up. Drug overdose deaths topped 100,000 annually in 2021. While there was a decrease in increase from a 30% increase during COVID years to a 15% increase the next year, the net deaths are kind of astronomical. Now, this is not to belittle threats like monkeypox or the CDC and who's somewhat cavalier attitude about the fact that it is not an STI, even if sexual transmission does increase exposure enough to almost ensure it. I want you to think about this for a minute. Worldwide, I can only find about 80 deaths from monkeypox. I'll put a link in for that. There are 100,000 deaths a year in the U.S. from narcotics overdose. Now, 100,000 out of 300 and something million, not a huge amount, but it's way more than a lot of things you panic about. And it is rising. It has been rising since the mid-aught teens. The introduction of fentanyl and stronger narcotics. The expansion of prescription opioids in the 90s. 
the use of various diamorphines, oxycodones, and other synthetic narcotics, other synthetic opiates, opioids, you might say, have been increasing for almost 20 years, and it affects almost every demographic group in almost every region. Let's look at some hard numbers. So, like murder, we, we measure opioid deaths per 100,000 adjusted for population. This is a pretty good understanding. And I want you to understand what that means. But let's look at the murder homicide rate, too, to compare this. The murder homicide rate in the U.S. in aggregate for all the U.S. is 5.32 per 100,000. In 2020, which we saw a 28% increase in murder from 2019, the murder rate was still only 6.5 per 100,000. That is how these are measured. That is the murder rate. Now compare that to the opioid epidemic. The net death per 100,000 is 21. That is four times higher than all murder. Now, I want you to know that. I want you to compare this to other countries. Murder rate by rich country, including Russia. All right, I'm going to look stuff up. You can see how we look this up. So the countries with the highest murder rate per 100,000. All right. El Salvador actually beat out Honduras this year, uh, in 2017. Honduras, when I when I lived in Mexico, was up to 61. Apparently, things are slightly peaceful there, more peaceful there. The U.S. Virgin Islands, by the way, is one of the worst. That's not the U.S. at overhaul. Salvador is 61 per 100,000. Honduras, 41 per 100,000. Venezuela, 49 per 100,000. United States Virgin Islands, U.S. territories are often quite violent. 49 per 100,000. Jamaica, 46 per 100,000. Belize, 37 per 100,000. Uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 36 per 100,000. Um, St. Kitts and Nuevas, uh, 36 per 100,000. South Africa, 35.7 per 100,000. The global average murder rate is 6.1 per 100,000. All right. Now look at rich countries. The United States is one of the three richest countries in the world in overall GDP. Not in per capita, but we can get to that later. Look at this. Japan, 0.2 per 100,000. Singapore, 0.2. Hong Kong, 0.3. Luxembourg, 0.3. Indonesia, 0.4. Norway, 0.5. Oman, 0.5. Switzerland, 0.5. The UAE, 0.5. China, 0.6. All right. Now, what is all this global comparison? So put it in perspective for you, but let's look at the rich countries. OECD, we'll look at the OECD nations murder rate per 100,000. And I want you to see this. For those of you who are watching along, I'm going to put these in the show notes for you. Canada, homicide rate is 0 0.2, 0 0.12 per 100,000. Israel, 0.15 per 100,000. Now notice that the OECD average is 0.26. Mexico, 26.8 per 100,000. It's the highest in the OECD. 
Now, the OECD are supposedly the rich nations. The United States, six per 100,000. Notice that it's double, or actually triple, uh, the average. Russian Federation, 4.8 per 100,000. Now, it has been higher than the U.S. in the past, but right now, it's lower. Still double the OECD average. But considering that the Russian Federation is significantly poorer than the U.S., that should not be the case. These are hard facts. This culture war you're fighting misses this. It misses the sensuous reality of your life. Now, should you be worried about murder in most of these countries? We'll figure out the population size. We're doing numbers per 100,000, but remember, and that's just so we can compare the rate across countries. But I want you to look at that opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic is approaching some of the most dangerous countries' murder rates in the world. No, it's not. It's it's still what half of Honduras or El Salvador, but Honduras and El Salvador have higher murder rates than a lot of countries that are technically at war. Are you okay with losing four times the population to opioid death? than to murder when our murder rate is three times the average of rich countries? Are you okay with that? Is that acceptable? Because I promise you, both those stats affect the poor. And they affect the poor, the most vulnerable poor, black and indigenous people in the poorest parts of the United States the most. Do you care? Or are you too busy fighting the culture war? And this is also true to all these culture war nonsense we see, the ruining of schools, making them ungovernable by constantly expanding bureaucracy, what even complaining about that bureaucracy. By constantly expanding mandates, by asking for more and more oversight and administration of high paying jobs, when a lot of school districts can't even hire aides that can. I'm going to point this out to you. Right now, a school aid makes less money than almost any fast food position in the area. Now, I'm not saying the fast food people deserve less money than the school aides. All right? I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm telling you is we don't have enough people in public institutions to run the basic parts of them. And yet consultancies and administration is growing by leaps and bounds. All right. We always talk about educational admitting increase and in colleges, but we have to look at this in terms of the actual money spent. Unfortunately, this is a libertarian talking point, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. The number of, of school district administrative staff increase from 2000 to 2017 was from countrywide was from about 97,000 to about 170,000, an increase of 75%.
principles also increase from that time period. The increase is about 33.4%. The number of teachers only rose 7.7%. And their pay stagnated or went down in terms of adjusting for inflation. Then you saw wildcat strikes. But I can promise you with the with um, state budgets seeming to need to contract or at least they're going to claim it needs to contract. You'll notice the military never gets hurt by any of this. Despite the push for additional education resources, I think we'll see real teachers' wages decline fairly massively in the next five years because the average raise is going to be between uh, probably between th 2 and 5%, depending on the part of the country. And inflation is 8%. You can do the math. And Democrats will probably argue that this will stop inflation. These are the real world. What is this culture war you're fighting on Twitter really doing about these things? What are these tiny mutual aid things really doing about these things? I'm pro mutual aid. I'm not against it at all. I've had people come on and I'm going to have people come on again to talk about it. But I want you to realize that if we're asking the, the lower middle class to support the poor and have the poor support themselves, which is a point of mutual aid, by the way, it is mutual. It is empowering. It's very hard to do with this kind of deficit. The reason why we've seen the growth of weird class theories is because the basic class theory that explains the engine and pump of capital does not explain our sensuous everyday lives. And it does not explain why it is so hard to have working class solidarity. And it does not explain why the more poor you are, the more likely you are to believe in meritocracy particularly if you're one of the fewer poor people who actually get a chance to move themselves up. Psychologically, this makes total sense. I can tell you from my own life, I used to believe it. And it doesn't do any good to have rich liberal professors tell you, you you don't have any hope. But it also doesn't do any good to justify these stories that people tell themselves when the facts are what they are. And equity is growing the only thing that reduced the net increase of the Gini coefficient in the United States, two things. COVID did for a year, and then it shot up. Show you those stats, too. You can see uh, low wage occupation saw recovery, although that's now stalled out and is less than inflation. This is from about a year ago. Um, women in the labor market have done a lot worse than men, although that's been slightly reversed in the last few months. Men are taking a hit now. The growth in logistics and construction is vastly slowing down. Um, Although we don't know how many women are going to re-enter the workforce because childcare is still prohibitively expensive. But we saw some slowing of wealth and equity during the beginning of the pandemic. But that's not true in general. And on a worldwide scale, it's very bad. We saw worldwide, we saw one... Uh, 120 million, that's a third of the population of the U.S., my friends, be pushed into extreme poverty. And we saw a massive global recession with a temporary increase. And we look to be going back into a global recession now. In the beginning of a recession, we have Belt and Road Initiative money being able to help a lot of these poorer countries from China in the form of fairly low interest loans. But those loans are probably drying up. 
as we've seen, we're beginning to have the development of sovereign debt crises. And that will make any country, even a magnanimous one, less likely to lend. And the cost of housing and the homelessness problem is ridiculous. But I want you to think about what we've provided. I'll just pick one state, California, because it spends an inordinate amount on it. Twenty-eight percent of the population, uh, uh, twenty-eight percent of the whole country's uh, homeless population is in California. California is not twenty-eight percent of the United States population. So California has a disproportionate amount. 70% of the unhoused uh, have no shelter. 65% of them are male. 32% of them are chronically or long-term houseless or homeless. Um, 23% have severe mental illness. 16% of them are families with children, 8% of them are youth under 24, and 41% of them are in Los Angeles alone. Why is this happening? Well, California has basically been losing its intermediary classes for a long time, particularly in the urban, the two urban mega districts. What are we doing about that? California spends seven point two billion dollars on homelessness related programs. Now, I've seen estimates on how you can deal with this. Um, one is to build permanent shelters, but if they have to buy them at market rate, um, it would seven hundred and fifty million dollars would literally only get you one thousand five hundred units in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has at least sixteen thousand chronically homeless people, not temporary homeless people, chronically homeless people. Now, there are other things that you could do. Which, for example, is seizing um, derelict or existing motels, single office, single room occupancy properties, and turn them into homeless uh, to to housing for the homeless. Um, by grants and in state laws and uh eminent domain for but they're not going to do it even though it would be relatively popular and not particularly expensive it would probably be significantly cheaper than what california is doing now and this brings me to the last thing the thing that i've been a little bit too quiet on I've been pointing out that the military is what secures the U.S. spinning apparatus. People have interpreted this, and my friend Keith has interpreted this as me being soft on imperialism. Let me make it very clear. I've opposed all of America's war wars. The Ukraine situation was a situation that I thought was wasteful and unnecessary. And that the West, not just the United States, I do not count Europe as blameless or just our puppets in this. But the West has not aided or listened to 
Russian concerns on. Does that make Russia correct in what it did? No. Does that make NATO aggression why this happened now? Absolutely not. But that's irrelevant to our role and how it happened and why geostrategically we might be dumping tons of mo money into a void to tie up Russian military development for a little while. But there's something else we have to look at. If U.S. naval power is what secures global trade, we have to ask ourselves, well, it's falling apart. Very few people have paid a price for what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I want you to look at this. $14 trillion spent by the Pentagon since 9-11. About half of of its general budget. And we don't really know the full budget of the Pentagon, by the way. There's, the, the, it can't be audited. It went to contractors. So military Keynesianism was allowed to exist in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. But during the Bush administration, it began to expand the neoliberal logic of contracting from what it did to the welfare sector and the public sector in general to the military. Half of all defense spending. About $14 trillion went to defense contractors. Now, it didn't just go into mercenaries. It went into all things, logistics, you know, hell, even the mess halls contracted out these days. And it's not just this. Prisons are the same way. I remember going to, uh, I was working on opposing the uh, the building of a detention center right before COVID hit um, by ICE. And I remember one of the MTC was the company. And I remember them bragging that the private prisons were the, were the largest private contractors for the federal and state governments of land and land owners and thus one of the primary state real estate owners in the country. Does it occur to you what that means? Now, sure, various leftists will throw these out as single issues. You might hear about it on liberal talk shows, but have you really adjusted for these facts? Or are you busy fighting a culture war and pretending we're going to have a civil war tomorrow? Which, by the way, increasingly these conditions make the civil war an actual possibility particularly when you combine that with the degradation of law, which we have seen through the, through the will of the Supreme Court. But let's be honest. The Warren Court began this. The court that we lionized, that expanded civil liberties, did so largely by novel legal logic, Legal logic that even progressives like Rose Bader Ginsburg were worried about because they weren't strong and would be easy to argue away. But we now know it is just a majority of the court that can decide. As soon as you have more than five, you can even edge out your moderates. This is the reality of the situation, my friends. Marxism might give you a compass of the pump that's driving this. It will give you the large apparatus. But we have to do the work and look at the facts and read the statistics and going to the pupils. We have to do the boring shit instead of arguing everything by textual exegesis. And there are other concepts that are even more clarifying than this. And they're definitely more clarifying than talking about some French theorist 24-7 or some arcane new class theory that doesn't have clear parameters. We also should stop pretending that in these scenarios that it is clear that in the immediate 
or even midterm run that class solidarity would be materially obvious to people on a broad scale. Sectional solidarity would make sense. But the sections are often at each other's throats. And even Marx was aware of this. He talked about the four forms of alienation. And one of those forms is worker from worker, both sectional and individual, as alienation and competition increases your distrust of each other. And while it is in your immediate interest to do so, it is not in your long-term interest at all. But we should quit pretending it is some mystical thing like false consciousness that makes this true. The reason why leftists annoy me, and look, I I actually think that the, the beautiful the beautiful loser syndrome are the no true Scotsman fallacies on the left are the all other leftists suck but me and my and my group of two thousand people are you know are I have conservative views essentially or I'm a nationalist for another country and don't want to admit it so I had it in leftist language. All these things are common. They're all just they're all distractions, they're all dishonest. All right. If you think the left is irredeemable, quit being a leftist. But we do have to admit that the discourses have seemed seemingly, and even the good ones, not just the weird ones, all right, and not just on Twitter. There's an entire declass a para academic development of gurus from bread tube to the podcast specter of which technically let's be honest i'm a part not declass a but still if the discourse always seems to be around fads or all this, well, we, we're looking at every one of these stats that I'm talking about today, many of whom I feel like we've just dropped from the conversation. Like the opioid epidemic has gotten worse and we talk about it less. Is that because it didn't fit our defund the police thing? Are, are we talking, you know, we, we seem pr- really uncomfortable with talking about the homicide rate. Is that because of that too? Well, let's be honest, okay? I think that the police are so distrusted in the community and rightly and have made it clear and known that their primary duty is to defend property, which it is, by the way, and it's even legally adjudicated as such, that they've lost all popular legitimacy. But just defunding them, as I've said many times, only makes them mad and less likely to do anything, even the pathetically little that they did before, but doesn't get rid of them and doesn't replace them with any other thing, even a non-violent, non-occupational thing that deals with these real social problems that come from poverty. Or at least are in a feedback loop with poverty and lumpenization. And if it is conservative to talk about that, then it's conservative to talk about the reality of a lot of people's lives. And it is very hard for me not to notice that a whole lot of people who are like that do not come from the working poor, do not get phone calls from their friends about how they got kicked out of their house because they lost two weeks of income and they can't stop drinking. Yes. 60% of people under 35 have attended some college. And this is another thing I want to tell you. All right. How middle class people can't afford what, what the average person could afford before. And you might say, well, it was from settled colonialism. And I would say you're probably correct. But we haven't undone the taking of the land, nor has anyone got a viable plan for how to undo it. And yet... Everything has gotten worse. I want you to look at this. Between 1899 and 1964, so we're not even dealing with modern. By the way, now the average graduation rate is 90%, so you can see where it is. Uh, literacy has not really increased since the 70s either. Um, only 6.4% of the population graduated high school. When my, when my grandfather was in school, uh, in the 19, actually, I don't have date. We don't have dates for the war. That's interesting. 
Oh, we only have them for every 10 years. Um, so around, it was before the 40s. So it was in this time period where school almost doubled, um, but still wasn't a majority of the population. My grandfather, who bought his house, it was a mill house. It was not, it was crappy, but he bought one, raised a family in it, wasn't even a, a veteran, so he didn't get the GI Bill. He didn't get drafted because he was the only surviving male member of his family. Um, he was perfectly literate, was an avid reader, had an eighth grade education. I don't say that to romanticize old schooling. It was, you know, literacy was pretty low back then compared to now. Um, although we've been at pretty high literacy rates since the beginning of the 20th century. But I want you to look at this. Only 20, probably about 40%. Let's just split the difference in this growth, right? Between 30% and 50%. So less than 50% of the population when my father, when my grandfather was in high school, got a high school degree. Now we're at about 90%. All right. In 1944, it went down. I guess the GI Bill, James. But I want you to look at this. This was the amount of people who went to high school in 1944. It's 42%. That's the same amount of people that get a graduate degree now. This is the complications of the PMC thesis that thinks that physical labor is somehow magical. All right. Um, the blue collar, uneducated working class is only like 13%. And I promise you, a lot of that 13% actually has degrees. So. We saw this massive increase here, right, in the 20th century. No, I, I think that's actually going to get reversed because of labor shortages. I think you're going to see decredentialing of teachers, and you're going to start seeing rolling backs of mandatory schooling because we don't need to control as many people from entering low-skilled workforce anymore. And capitalists aren't stupid. But despite all this education... We can't seem to make anything work. As I've said before, the United States and Europe and even Russia have some of the most education population, most educated populations the world has ever known. And yet basic competency from elite seems beyond them. Now I talk about complexity theory and I want to talk about the concept of Klug soon. And I think that explains a lot of this. But I want you to really take all this in. If your theoretical or cultural discussions, and I'm not saying that defending people, uh, you know, queer people or people of color isn't important. I absolutely think it is. But I think if we dealt with these issues, we would be defending them too. Whereas we can talk about that till the cows come home, not protect any of those people and not deal with any of this. But it can make us feel really righteous on Twitter. I was asked why I was why we were talking about Curtis Yarvin or whatever. Now I'm interested in why people like Peter Thiel, people with a lot of money, want to give people like Curtis Yarvin money. I'm interested in what what is funding all these things and why it matters, because someone thinks it does. But is it also a distraction? We have to ask ourselves during the period of quantitative easing. Why did the rich get so much richer? Because they did. And they didn't even produce anything. Why have we experienced secular stagnation in technology? Even, even neoliberal hacks like Tyler Cohen admit that. Even if they think we're too pessimistic now. Don't be distracted by every little fad that comes up. You're living in a dream world because reality is getting harder. It's getting uglier. It is what it is. It is not unilaterally getting ugly. There are, there are innovations every day. But anyone who tells you the Steven Pinker view of the world or that everything is doom and gloom and we're all going to be back in the Stone Age next year is probably lying. There are looming crises after crises. And they're only going to get worse. But a lot of the major crises we aren't even talking about enough anymore. They've dropped out of the conversation because they seem boring. Or because they don't fit our narratives. 
I'm tired of people calling me and asking me why Marxists aren't talking about homeless people and opioid addiction. I'm tired of people thinking that we're okay with these wars or that we think we have to cheerlead some other nation unequivocally. But I will say this. A lot of nations are going to have a problem. Now, I'm not a believer in the inherent worth of nations. I'm, I, nations are a way we culturally divide each other up. They're language groups. They have some ethnic roots. They are based in some real lived communities, but they are expanded to the point of absurdity in the modern nation state. And particularly since a lot of the nation states we're talking about are not technically nation states. They do not consist of one nationality group. None of the big polar things in the multipolar world are just one national ethnic group. This is not Europe in the 17th century after the fall of the great empires. It's not Europe in the 19th century, in the early 20th century after the fall of the great empires even, which is really when it happened. Nor did the decolonial world get this either because the maps were drawn by the colonists and they didn't consider the languages and ethnic groups in the first place and they kind of made them up. And when they didn't make them up, they invented them synthetically like in the Soviet Union in a lot of cases. So, no, I don't believe in the historical legitimacy of concepts like nations, but we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it the United States business to deal with any of that? And I don't think so. Or at least we should be pressuring our government as best we can to lead to more just settlements and not to turn Ukraine into a bloodbath, not just for the Russians, but also for the Ukrainians' sake. Do you think that the other countries are any less profitable to tears off of this stuff? Do you think that any of these militaries are noble and good and not full of profiteering hacks? War is racket, my friends. That's why traditionally it was no war but class war, not some war that you can project on. But that also means you shouldn't be defending NATO. Or any of that nonsense either. Now, I can completely understand why Finland and and Sweden might do what they've done in regards to NATO. Why Aldragon might be pulling a Nasser and playing one side off the other. I can understand that logically because that's the incentive system that we have. Condemning that in that incentive system is only useful if you can offer an alternative. And we can't. But pretending that this is good or just, just should prop, justice should be a word that you only ever use rhetorically. Because if you believe in it, you're a child. I have to thank some patrons because I keep my promises. My Connie Oklahonans, there are four ones from last month. I'd like to thank them. These are people who donate $10 or more to support the show. That is Marshall L, Leo, no last name, Max K, and REB. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You enable me to rant. I'll put the links of everything I reference, including where I looked up on the spot and let you see me reference uh, as I go. Think about what all this means and think about what you can do about it. And quit, quit pretending. We're only looking at things in one issue variant. Quit thinking that some theoretical question or question of history is going to solve all this. The history is important. I actually completely think it is. I don't think you can understand how fascism happened without understanding almost the entirety of the 19th century, nor can you understand what the coming reaction might be. And notice I said might because we don't know, right? Anything I say you should take provisionally because I'm not a future predictor. My odds have been fairly good historically, but I'm not. I was wrong about what Zelensky was going to do in Ukraine, and it seems like things are even more corrupt than I thought. I was wrong. Um, I did not think that it was in his interest to let Ukraine go on this long. 
I also think that a lot of people are projected all kinds of things on all kinds of sides of this war foolishly. In some ways, everyone has performed poorly. But that has been true in most of the wars of the last 20 years. So if you think this Blue Water Navy thing I'm talking about is really protecting the world and holding it together, why is everything falling apart? And why do people know, even like Peter Zion, who is not a friend of the left, not an enemy either, but it's not a friend. Um, why are they predicting that this globalized moment is unsustainable now? Well, I think there is, and I think it goes all the way back to stuff I talked about in Joseph Tainter, and I can't mention it enough. But regardless, this is something you have to deal with. All right? We have tons of resources. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about resources. Going into things that they could be going elsewhere. Education, healthcare, community defense, finding a replacement for social ills, delumpinization, narcotics treatment, effective removal of homelessness, not an NGO industrial complex that eats up tons of money but doesn't fix the problem. effectively spending things, even on AIDS or teachers and not on massive amounts of administration in every sector of our lives. The people who actually do the work, teachers, nurses, etc., are increasingly marginal to the situation. Yes, nurses can scab on each other through agency and teachers can't. I wouldn't even be surprised if that's coming. All right, this has been a longer rant video. I hope I answered some of your questions. Think about it. Don't get sucked in the fads.